Well, good morning, church. How's good everybody morning. today? Good morning. We welcome everyone to Grace Street this morning, whether you're here in present or if you are online, we welcome you. Say hi in your comments section if you are online today so we know you're with us this morning. And watch for our announcements. They'll be popping up here shortly in the comments. And this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. What a wonderful day outside. Surprise. Right? Yes. See, every day doesn't have to be a sunny day to be a great day. We're getting cleansed and renewed with the water and the rain. It's part of the cycle that we have to have for our very lives. So God is providing for our very lives today. We just have to change our perspective to understand and look at the blessings that God gives us each and every day, right? Amen? Amen. Amen. So, we have a wonderful day today. This is the uh, start of our new engagement project from Dr. Del Tackett. We will start that at 7 o'clock on Wednesday nights. We'll have the Bible study and prayer time, just like we always do. Today's message then from uh, Pastor Terry is going to be on, uh, on not. So I, I just want you to think about that for a little while. Not K-N-O-T. So we're not talking knots that way. We're not talking N-A-U-G-H-T as in naughty. But we're talking N-O-U-G-H-T. English language, isn't it great? There's not, not, not. That's not funny, and it's not N-O-T either. So, you know, no wonder people get confused. But anyway, we have the engagement project starting today and running through for the next 10 weeks. So we look forward to that. Speaking of looking forward to things, I found something yesterday. I thought it was really cool. It was a picture of biscuits and gravy pizza, breakfast pizza. Why would you want to ruin it with pizza? <laughs> <laughs> Which segues right into men's breakfast this coming Saturday at 9 a.m. right here. So we look forward to coming and getting fed both with food and with the Word of God in our devotion that day. So uh, I started writing that devotion yesterday, and I'll get it finished up here this week so we can have it fresh and ready to go on Saturday morning. Then the following Saturday, uh, we have Orange Track Racing here again. That's going to be May 11th. Uh, always a good time. I, I ran into some other people, and I, and I know they had uh, some young boys in their family. And I said, you know, you really need to do this. And so I sent them a link to Orange Track Racing. So hopefully they'll come in and, and uh, start racing with us as well. Then, the week after that, the 18th, we're going to be showing the movie The Son of God with Gray Street Cinema. And that is an awesome, awesome movie. Uh, so I really look forward to this. It is a very good depiction of the life of Christ here amongst us on earth. And so at the end of our messages today and at the end of our service today, we will have all of our music and everything that Terry has curated for us today. We'll have a link for that in the notes for you that are online. And for the rest of us, we get to listen live here in person. So looking forward to that. Let's open our, our day with a word of prayer, shall we? Gracious Lord, we just come before you today and we, we are filled with your awesomeness. We, we come to get refreshed, refilled, and strengthened, renewed today to hear your word, both in word and in song. And Lord, we look forward to that today as we come to worship you, to submit ourselves to you today so that you can speak to us in whatever form you have for us today. Bring that word that you want us to hear into Terry's message so that we can be fed and we can be told what your will is for our lives. So as we go through the, the days today and, and through the message today, we just ask that you would open our ears to hear, open our eyes to see the glory and the beauty of our world. Lord, we know that you're bringing rain down today, and we ask that you would let that grace fall on us like rain today to fill us and overflow us with your grace, your mercy, and in your love. In Jesus' name, amen. So our call to worship this morning comes from Amos 8.11. Now, this is a book in the Bible not a lot of people go to on a regular basis. But 
it has some really cool stuff in it. So, And he is talking about the times of the Lord. And he says, surely the time is coming, says the sovereign Lord. Well, I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread and water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. Wow. Think about that. So God is saying, because you have rebelled against me, I'm not going to talk to you for a while. I'm not going to send any prophets. I'm not going to send any word to you during this time. You're going to have a famine of the word of God. And see, we live in those difficult times today. I mean, just look around us. It appears that even the most withdrawn, introverted person today in this world has to know that we live in a broken world. Has to know that this is not the way the world that God intended for us to have. And moreover, the society in which we live, starting you know as far back as 50 years ago, has sought to separate us from God. Taking up God out of our schools, out of our workplaces, out of very every facet of our lives if they could, if they could get away with it. So is it any wonder then that God would hide his word from those who have turned away from him? I mean, we're shutting God out of our lives, the very lives, the very institutions that he built for us, blessed us with, and we're shutting him out. So why wouldn't he turn away from us? Well, notice what I used in there. I used that term withdrawn, withdrawn. When we allow doubt or atheism, atheism, to separate ourselves from God, to overcome our belief systems. And I've talked about our belief systems uh, many, many times. But then when we do that, when we let that atheistic view come into our lives and say, oh, well, I don't know. Um, I don't know whether I believe in God or not or whether he exists or if his word is immutable or anything else. When we allow that to come in, then we're actually separating ourselves little by little from God himself. Your belief then becomes agnostic in nature, meaning that God may exist, but you haven't encountered him yet, so you're not whether you're sure you're going to believe in him, or your belief may be waning until finally atheism takes hold and you no longer even acknowledge that God exists. And that's when they come up to God as dead. See, this leads to wrath. When we look at the writings, uh, the Disciple Bible Study said that uh, this will lead to wrath when you separate yourself incrementally from God to the point where you're not even sure God exists anymore or is alive in your life. And the most horrible expression of God's wrath comes when he withholds his word from his people. And this is what Amos is talking about in here. That wrath of God is him separating himself from us through a gap so wide it will be like when heaven and hell comes to be. There is a gap between hell. The people in hell have no way to get to heaven because he put a vast expanse, is what it says in the Word of God. Put a vast expanse that is not able to be taken care of. So improper worship leads to God's wrath. Improper worship, false teachings, leads to God's wrath. As we begin our study of the engagement project, we begin our journey to draw closer to who God needs us to be. See, God created us, and he has a plan for our lives. And when we separate ourselves from God, then how are we going to know what that plan is for our lives, for God? And we stumble around in life aimlessly, aimlessly. And that's when that wrath comes into being. That's when doubt creeps in. That's when that atheistic view comes in. We're not sure if God's around because we're not sure if he exists anymore. And so we got to be very, very careful of who and what we listen to and what we read and what we study. So this morning, uh, before I even got out of bed, I, I, I posted up a reading from Luke that talks about the end times and, and they talked about what was gonna happen at the rapture of his people. And I wrote in there, I said, you know, what you hold in your heart then drives your actions to what you will do. And 
make sure that your heart is with God. So your actions are driven towards God, not the things of this world. Beware. Because even in the time of Noah, they didn't listen to what God was putting out to them. And as I posted a little later on, I said, well, this was kind of a tongue-in-cheek type thing. Uh, but I said, you know, when I think about it, and I think in the times of Noah, there was people who said, oh, it's raining outside. I think I'll stay home from church. And the creatures of the sea ate well. So think about it. Your actions and your reactions to what happens in the world today will determine your outcome. Now, I don't want to be you know, anybody's fodder. I don't want to be food for the next meal, so I would rather listen to God. So let's, let's uh, go to our messages today. Gracious Lord, we thank you for all of the different ways that you speak to us in our lives. We thank you for opening our minds up to what possibilities there may be and for revealing yourself and your mysteries to us as we draw in our relationship to you. As we draw closer to you, you reveal more of your word, more of those hidden mysteries that exist that we just never understood. So you bring that understanding into us. And so we look forward to that today. In the land of not today, we know that your voice rings louder than any of the noise of the world. And so help us focus in on your voice and help us not to separate ourselves from your voice in what we say and what we do. In Jesus' name. Now, before we get started, those of you that are old enough to remember, or so you have seen this in reruns, who remembers Jethro Bodine saying, not, not, when he was thinking about being a secret agent? <laughs> 007. Mm -hmm. He used the word not. And you're here, and now it gets better. Yes, yes we are very thankful that we're here. He's been blessed. In a land of not, and then it says a remnant of hope. Those two. Well, we're going to connect those dots today. Now, we've done the Truth Project, which, and I, and I showed this from her, but I don't think we made the correlation at the time. When we look at our uh, top viewed videos on YouTube, the Truth Project stands out above pretty much everything else. And we've also done this Genesis history. Now it's time for the engagement project. So are you ready for this next step? Today, as we begin this new series, this, the engagement project, we're going to, well, let's back up. The previous studies helped us to develop a comprehensive, systematic, biblical worldview. And that helped us create that foundation. Now, we, Jesus talks a lot about a foundation in one of his parables when he talks about uh, building a foundation on rock or on sand. We have to have a strong foundation. And with this as our foundation, we're ready to move on to the next question. We're going to move from why did Jesus come to why did Jesus leave? Now, Dr. Tackett, in his study, he, uh, the previous study, the Truth Project, we talked about the meta narrative of God and we talked about the different epics. Well, there was creation. There was fall, there was redemption, and restoration. But we're going to sneak one in there this time and go right between redemption and uh, restoration and put engagement. 
And I realized in my notes that I had missed that, so I had to quickly write that down this morning. So let's get that out of the way and go deeper here. To know him more deeply and then to uh, is to help us to understand who we truly are. Why we are still here and what God has asked us to do. Now, we see this all the time. And, and I've been seeing this since I was a kid, so it's nothing new. i got to imagine it's been going on since time began. People trying to understand what their purpose in life is. People kind of drifting through life, not knowing. Some can't figure it out, and they just go to college, go to college, and get a just a generic liberal arts degree. Some of them, like Mark, go out and get nuclear engineering degrees. But even in doing that, sometimes we can't figure out who we are and what our purpose is. And there's only one way to do that, and that is to know God and to have a relationship with him. So over the next 10 weeks, we're going to be taking this next step by seeking the face of God and coming to know him like we never have known him before. I, had, I was sitting this morning doing my devotions, and I finished up. And I was just sitting there, and of course, you know, the sun coming up sooner, it wasn't dark anymore, so I'm looking out the back door, which is a big screen door, or sliding door, and I thought, what if Jesus were to come back today? And it went further than that, it went to what is going to change? Everything that we see as important in our lives, all those little things that bug us, or even the big things that drive us crazy, they're gone. This, an era like we can never possibly imagine, except for what the Bible tells us, comes into play. So it's through this quest that we hope and pray that you will be deeply transformed so that when he does come back, you are gathered up with him. God has entrusted us, common everyday Christians, common everyday believers, into the primary work of the kingdom. Pray with me. Lord, bless the body of Christ. It is our prayer that we would simply begin to do what you have asked us to do. By doing this, Father, we are convinced it will change everything. Father, we believe it and we receive it. And we truly believe and receive that it will change each and every one of our lives. That it will radically transform our families. And, Lord, by your grace, that it will turn this world up side down. Actually, Lord, let me rephrase that. And I will turn this world right side up because right now we are upside down. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So, now the question is, where do we start? Well, before we get started, we have to understand that not everyone acknowledges <clears throat> the same God that we do. Some people's God isn't even a thought of God. It's, it's money, it's possessions, it's many things, but some are other religions where they have different gods. And there are many different factions within even the same types of religions. So when you look at the Jewish religion, there are multiple factions. When you look at Islam, when you look at Hinduism, when you look at Christianity, there are different factions. We've talked about it before. There's over 40,000, I think it's over 45,000 now, different denominations throughout the world. And it's actually splintering more. I'm just reading an uh, article this morning about a major denomination that is going to regionalized conferences. So it's splintering even further. And one of the things Mark talked about this morning was agnosticism. 
Well, there's an ever-growing number of people that identify as either agnostic and even more that are identifying as atheistic. We also have to understand that our world is in a state of disarray. As believers, we need to have the ability to look at what isn't happening around us and what is actually going on. People struggle to get along. So much so that I miss the days where we could disagree with someone, friend or not, stand up, shake hands, walk away. And walk away as either friends or as new friends, even though we disagree. And we've talked about this before. If someone or a group of people disagrees with you now, without that handshake of disagreement, we agreed to disagree, but we're still friends, now they seek to cancel you. And it's gotten much easier to do that. Used to be that people just spread rumors, gossip, which we know what the Bible says about that. Now they take to social media. And it seems like every day or every week there is a new social media platform out there. And people are jumping on them like crazy and they spew whatever they want. And this is happening to not just businesses, because we've seen that happen. We've seen businesses take billion dollar hits. But it, now it's happening to people. And what happens when it happens to actual people? And depression can set in and that can slip you down a very slippery slope. In Romans 12, Paul warns us, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. It's because the behaviors and customs of this world are so selfish and often corrupt that people get led down a bad path or the wrong path. Worldly behavior as Christians or as believers in Christ, let's, call, let's say it like that, as believers in Christ, should be off limits. Should have nothing to do with the world's behaviors. And it should go deeper than that, not just as off limits. It, that's not enough. It needs to go deeper. In that passage, it says, I've got to transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. We have to be careful not to do it on our own. If we try it on our own, we're susceptible to some things, which are also sinful. Pride. Coveting. In other words, wanting something someone else has. You remember the old saying, keeping up with the Joneses? Mm -hmm. Selfishness. This one I know all too well. Stubbornness. And arrogance. Thinking you are better than everyone else. It's only when we allow the Holy Spirit to renew us, to re-educate us and redirect our minds that we can be truly transformed. Now, back up a few chapters to Romans 8, 5, Paul's warning us to be mindful of being controlled by the world rather than letting the Holy Spirit guide us. And he says this, he says, writes, those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things, but those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. If Jesus had not provided a way out for us, we would all be dominated by a sinful nature. That's why he had to leave. It's a good thing, too. As I mentioned before, we live in a culture and a world that's in disarray. Now, I think we can all agree on that since the definition of disarray is a lack of order or sequence, confusion, disorder, I mean, not many people will say, my teenager's room is in disarray. 
but you hear it in the news. It's used to describe different things. Same thing. So why isn't this message titled In Land of Disarray? Now, I have to think it's because so many are afraid to take a stand, to say or to do something that might get them canceled, that instead they do nothing. And that is the simple definition from the dictionary of not. Nothing. So, back to the question, where do we start? Well, we need to know what ought to be. We need to trust in God's guidance, not in how we feel. In our call to worship this morning, Pastor Mark read to us from Amos 8 11. There is definitely a famine of God's word in the world today. But I'm certainly glad that verse 12 hasn't come into play yet. Because if we take it into that verse, you'll hear a little bit more. The time is surely coming, says the Sovereign Lord, when I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread or water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. Here's the next piece. People will stagger from sea to sea and wandering from border to border, searching for the word of the Lord, but they will not find it. We can still find it. There are places such as Great Street Church where people can go and find the true word of God. So this also brings us back to the time of the message this morning in the land of not. The definition, like I said before, is nothing. It's scary to think that nothing, not, has changed in 2,000 plus years. Israel rejected the words of the Lord in Amos' time, before and after, and it continues today. Their appetite for God's word was gone, so what did God do? He took it away from them. They would then go into exile where there was no word from the Lord at all. Now, I know how I feel when I'm not getting fed on a weekly basis. What if that was, I wasn't getting fed and that was the beginning of a famine of God's word? I feel crappy after a week. I can't imagine what two weeks, a month, or years would even feel like. I almost feel like I should have done like Mark did that one day and put a strip of masking tape on the wall. And now, 2,000 plus years later, people are still constantly and consistently removing God's word from everywhere. Mark mentioned it this morning. It's getting removed from our schools. It's getting removed from everywhere. But just as the Israelites would come to find out, we too are realizing that it was, and still is, our most precious possession, God's word. The Israelites repeatedly rejected God's words until they were no longer able to hear what he was saying to them. Fortunately, we've not gotten to that point where God has taken it completely away from us. As people move further and further away from God's word, they are looking less and less to scripture and more and more to the world for their answers. Because there are still believers like you and me, there is still a remnant of hope. Now you can see where a land of not and a remnant of hope come together. We need to help guide them. Sometimes with their words, sometimes without. Here are the words that the Lord spoke to Joshua when he took Moses' place. From Joshua 1, 7 and 9. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the instructions Moses gave you. Do not deviate from them, turning either to the right or to the left. Then you will be successful in everything you do. Study this book of instruction continually. Meditate on it day and night so you will be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. This is my command. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. 
What if it read, be strong and courageous, be careful to obey all the instructions that Jesus gave you? Jesus came, he instructed, he expanded on the Old Testament, on, he expanded on the instructions that Moses gave the Israelites. He modeled how we should fulfill our God-given purpose in our lives. Like Israel, we must meditate on Scripture and carefully take note of everything written in it. That means going through it in your mind over and over. As we do, God's Word becomes ingrained deeper and deeper into our soul. As it is, and through the work of the Holy Spirit, our actions are from God's perspective, not how we should see them. We need to look through through God's lens. Here's what Jesus didn't say about our lives. He didn't say that it would be easy. He didn't say that uh, it'd be what you expected it to be. He didn't say it would be without pain or suffering. In fact, Jesus did say, from John 15, 18, and 19, if the world hates you, remember that it hated me first. The world would love you as one of its own if you belonged to it. But you are no longer part of the world. I chose you to come out of the world so it hates you. So choosing Jesus or not choosing Jesus means putting your eternal life on the line. It also means putting your earthly life on the line. Your eternity is spent in one of two places, heaven or hell. And I'm not going to be up here being a fire and brimstone preacher. I don't believe in that. But I also know people need to know the facts. And there's only two destinations. But putting our earthly life on the line. We don't see that so much here in the United States. Years ago, I got turned on, I, because I love DC Talk, I got turned on to some books that they had published called Jesus Free. And in these books, which I, just the book themselves is really cool because all the pages are, they're not cut evenly, they're, they're ragged on the edges. But the one that always seems to pop into my mind is of this group of people who were believers in Christ in a country that did not allow it. They were taken out in the dead of winter. So think negative temperatures taken onto a frozen lake in rows and columns ordered to strip completely naked and stand there and the only reason any single one of them moved they would not denounce their faith is because they died one of the soldiers, and this is long time, one of the soldiers saw this and immediately, so remember I said sometimes use words, sometimes not. The soldier went out, stood in that person's place, stripped down, and took their place. He came to know Jesus because of the actions of those people. More recently, I've seen in the news of a man who was uh, tried, to, that ISIS tried to burn him like three times. They poured 20 gallons of gas on him. But like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, he walked away unscathed. Putting our earthly life on the line. If we jump ahead to John 16, Jesus tells why he told the disciples and us these things amongst so many others. He said, I have told you these things so you won't abandon your faith. For you will be expelled from the synagogues. And the time is coming when those who kill you will think they are doing a holy service of God. This is because they have never known the Father or me. Yes, I'm telling you these things now so that when they happen, you will remember my warning. So we shouldn't be shocked when we're criticized or even rejected for our standards and our beliefs. 
And sadly, this may come from family or friends, employers, customers, coworkers, the government, the list goes on and on. Not everyone is going to accept what you have done and the way that you are now living your life. Jesus came to save the world, but in doing so, he brought division. And I preached a sermon on this next passage once, and it brought division in or after the service. I was approached and rebuked for teaching this message. But they didn't get grasp what it means. See, Jesus says in Luke 12, 49 and 53, I have come to set the world on fire, and I wish it were already burning. I have a terrible baptism of suffering ahead of me. And I am under a heavy burden until it is accomplished. Do you think I have come to bring peace to the earth? No, I have come to divide people against each other. From now on, families will be split. Apart three in favor of me and two against, or two in favor and three against. Father will be divided against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother. Mother-in-law against daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. first thing I thought of when I was reading this passage and preparing was the term baptism by fire. And this doesn't exist in the scriptures. This is not a, uh, this is a secular term that you hear. We're baptized by fire. Often used in work. In fact, I might have, I don't even remember if I used it Monday night when Mark and I met when we were talking about some of the people that are being hired to take his place as he prepares for retirement next year. But they're being pushed out into the wild and to get that things done they're being baptized by fire meaning they are going to learn as they go and as they make mistakes they'll learn not to make those again hopefully but the baptism that Jesus is talking about here is what he will soon go through so let's go and I love this version of the dictionary it's Webster's 1828 dictionary and I've got a copy of that from uh, some folks who used to be with us and now live in Florida. But the definition, if we look at that, and we have to look at number two for this, it's the sufferings of Christ. What Jesus would experience the physical death of his earthly body would not even begin to compare to the spiritual pain that would come from being separated completely from God. That his pain when he was separated spiritually from God is worse than that famine of God's word because he's completely removed from it. Jesus came to bring God's word to all who would believe in him. And this brought a lot of division. And it still does today. Families get divided. Friends get divided. But this just goes right back and shows the interwining of the Old Testament and New Testament. This is actually fulfillment of Micah 7, 6. Some will accept him, while others will. He will be rejected. Those who accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior might not be just criticized and rejected. <clears throat> Depending on where you live in the world, they also run the risk of death. These people are so thirsty for the word of God that they will take the one Bible that they have and they will tear pages from it and give it to all the believers. And then they will memorize those pages front and back. And then they will trade them until they've gotten through the entire book. If they're found with even one page, death is imminent. There's a couple of books that I'm reminded of when it comes to that. But first, there's a, a quote from Dr. Tackett in, the, in Wednesday night's study where he says, because when you truly gaze upon the face of God, there's a possibility that you will be radically changed. Radical. Radically. There's a book by David Platt called Radical. 
taking back your faith from the American dream. He examines how American Christianity, I like how he calls it American Christianity, has manipulated the gospel to fit cultural preferences and challenges re uh, readers to rediscover the path. And that led me to another book. And this, the writer of this book is actually in uh, the trailer we've seen for the engagement project. His name is Francis Chan. He wrote a book called Multiply, Making, or Disciples Making Disciples, where he seeks to equip others to carry out Jesus' ministry. There are so many different things that we can use. But just like these books, this series seeks to get back to the basics and to live out God's purpose for our lives. When we come into the presence of God, we can, and dare I say, should lose ourselves. But in a good way. Too often we lose ourselves in these. We need to get lost in the presence of God. Lose ourselves in the presence of God. Some find it difficult to believe that man can have encounters with God. Remember when Jesus went up onto the mountain? He met. And Peter was all just discombobulated. How about that for my $10 word of the day? When we encounter God, we encounter his ultimate truth. When Adam and Eve ate the fruit, they had a different encounter with God than what they had been used to. They had been used to just a one-on-one -on -one encounter with God, just on a daily basis. But what happened after they ate the, of the fruit? They hid because they were afraid. Now, I've always wondered something. Maybe you have too. I've always wondered why they didn't just look at the serpent and say, why don't you eat the fruit? It's a fair question. You want to be like God, why don't you eat the fruit? When Nebuchadnezzar encountered God, what did he do? He ate grass. When Noah encountered God, he built an ark. You <laughs> didn't I didn't know you were going to post that up this morning. When Jacob encountered God, they wrestled and he walked away. He won, but he walked away with a limp and a new name, Israel. When Isaiah encountered God, he realized his sin and thought it was all over. In fact, let's look at Isaiah 6, 1 and 10. It was a year in which King Uzziah died that I saw the Lord. He was sitting on a lofty throne and the train of his robe filled the temple. Attending him were mighty seraphim, have, each having six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. They were calling out to each other, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of heaven's armies. The whole earth is filled with his glory. Their voices shook the temple to its foundations, and the entire building was filled with smoke. And I said, it's all over. I am doomed. I am a sinful man. I have filthy lips and I live among a people with filthy lips. Yet I have seen the King, the Lord of Heaven's armies. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal he had taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. And he touched my lips with it and said, see, this coal has touched your lips. Now your guilt is removed and your sins are forgiven. Then I heard the Lord asking, Whom shall I send as the messenger to this people? Who will go for us? I said, Here I am. Send me. And he said, Yes, go. And say to hit this people, Listen carefully, but do not understand. Watch closely, but learn nothing. Harden the hearts of these people. Plug their ears and shut their eyes. That way they will not see with their eyes, nor hear with their ears, nor understand with their hearts, and turn to me for healing. Sometimes it takes a tragedy in our lives 
or other negative circumstances for us to truly see God. How often do we hear of terrible circumstances in someone's life and they turn to God? How many times have we heard of bad things happening to someone, but their strength is buoyed by their encounter with God? I will always remember Mark's dad's story telling us of their trip to Des Moines in the middle of a blizzard. I'm buoyed today by a, a former co-worker who has metastatic breast cancer. We'll be having a double mastectomy at the end of the month, or next, this coming week. They found more spots and they had to do another scan. She has been on her knees praying. People have been on their knees praying. The spots, no, they are cancer. At least not anymore. The only one can only know Jesus as the Lord and Savior, and that relationship has to grow. If it's not, then we're not engaged. And instead of adopting and living the way that the world is that God wants us to, we're doing so in the way that the world has influenced us to. There are a lot of distractions, and even more so today than there were a hundred years ago. But it's in difficult circumstances that we shift our focus from the world and back to the creator of the world. God radically changes us when we encounter him. God radically changes us so that when we do encounter him, we can learn our purpose. Isaiah was prompted to get engaged, and when the Lord asked, Whom should I send as a messenger to this people? Who will go for us? Now, if you heard that passage the last couple times I've read it, you heard, Whom shall I, or who should I send? I, singular, who should who will go for us, plural. This goes back to our triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But again, that's in it for another sermon. But just as Isaiah, we need to respond by saying, Here I am, Lord, send me. When I encountered God, back in 2003, yeah, you can bet. I might not have said it in those exact words, but it was, yes, Lord, send me. I'm ready to go. I'm ready to serve. You see, living in a culture of not or nothing isn't easy. All we have to do is pick up the Bible and read it. It's full of examples. And those ring just as true today as they did then. As a people of God, we are a remnant. We need to engage others. We need to continue this journey of getting to know God. So we invite you to join us over the next 10 weeks on this journey as we learn to engage others with wisdom. As then, we will all understand what it is that God is asking us to do. Gracious Lord, as we end this portion of our service today, we just thank you. Father, I pray that each of us, that with a pure heart and a trusting spirit, would come before you and have an encounter. And as we encounter you, Lord, that we would see our purpose, the reason that we are here. Father, you did redeem us by sending your one and only Son so that we could have eternal life. Lord, I pray that the Holy Spirit would continue to work in us and through us. I pray that your word, which is written on our hearts, would cause our hearts to burn. That it would light us on fire. That we would be good. 
be unstoppable. Father, I pray for repentance in our land, repentance in our world that would lead to a revival that would match none other in history. Lord, thank you for your incredible victory over sin and death. Father, remove Satan and all the powers of evil from our homes and our relationships and our families, from every aspect of our lives. And Father, as we embark on this 10-week journey, Father, I pray for victory. And I am encouraged, Father, by your word and what you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you, Pastor Terry. As we pr proceed here into our time of communion this morning, I want you to think about that graphic that we saw up on the screen where we saw the tree was gone. The tree had died, and yet out of the middle of it came life. And see, that's the same thing that we were talking about when we come and we join together for communion. Because communion means to come together. And we're called to remember that through Christ's death on the cross, it gave us life because we were dead in our sins. And through his death, we gained life, life eternal through Christ. And so as we come into this time here, uh, I want you to understand that. I want you to think about that. That without his death on the cross, we would not have a promise of life yet to come. More than the life that we're living right now but life eternal in the presence of, of God himself. So as we, as we come into this time, it's all part of God's plan. God had the plan from the time that he created the universe, the, the time he created us. And as Pastor Terry said, a lot of times what we tend to do, and we were talking about that earlier this morning, is God created us in his image. But a lot of times what we tend to do in the world today with the influences of the world is we try to make God conform to our image of who we want him to be, not who he is. See, we want God to fit into our mold, into our lives. But we need to do the exact opposite. We need to submit our will, die to ourselves in order to submit to the will of God. Christ had to die himself to submit fully to the will of God so that we, out of his death then, we earn salvation. Not by the things we do, but by our belief, by our trust in him. So as we come into this time of communion today, I want you to think about that renewal of life that when Christ was given up, he took bread and he broke his body and he said, this is my body which is broken for you. I'm dying to myself. Likewise, he took a cup. Later on in the meal, he held it up and he said to the disciples, this is the cup of the new covenant. My blood shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. His blood had to be shed. He had to die to himself to give us that life, that promise of everlasting life. As we come into this engagement project, as I said last week in my message, he did all this for us, but we have to do our part. We have to step up. Whom shall I send? Who will go for me? We have to step up. We have to do our part. So he's calling us to be engaged to him, joined in communion with him, in communion with him, with his body and his blood, and to be able to fulfill the great commission that he put upon our hearts, which was to go into all the world and make disciples of all men, baptizing him in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, so that they might 
in turn receive eternal life, the gift that was given to us. So think about that as we take of the bread and drink of the cup today. The body of Christ broken for you. Take and eat. And the blood of Christ shed for you. Take and drink. And as always, thanks be to God. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, it's now time for prayers for the people. So if anybody would like prayer, I'm willing to try. <laughs> uh, um, I wish for a coworker who uh, didn't hurt the husband. <coughs> Grandma passed away. Okay. Visitation today. Okay. So, coworker. She lived a really good life and things, but it's hard for the family. She was kind of um, mm -hmm. right. who everybody went to. Right. The glue. She, she was, was the glue. glue. <laughs> yeah. Grandmas tend to be that way sometimes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, Father God, we come to you this morning to praise and honor you in all things. In faith believing that you are the one and only God, King of the universe. Therefore, as in Galatians 6, 9 through 10 says, Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Father God, we come before you today acknowledging the challenges of practicing gratitude in all things. Help us to center our thanksgiving in Christ, for in you we can find true joy and peace in helping others and forgiving others of their iniquities. We thank you for your gift of salvation and hope for the future. Help us to forgive one another as you forgive us of our transgressions and bless us even though we may not deserve it. As we pray for those in need, please let the Holy Spirit rest among us and hear our prayer, O Lord. Father God, I lift up Larry and Jen to you today. We thank you for their lives as Larry has struggled with cancer for four years now. He has seen miracles of healing and then setbacks. We lay them at your feet today, Father God. We ask for healing for you, for all of them, and through it all, let your divine will be done. I thank you that Tanya's surgery went well Friday, and I ask that she will find you in the midst of her healing. I ask for spiritual guidance for Trey's mother, Susan, and ask for divine protection through her life. Please be with our homeless each and every day to guide them into a better life with you. Protect and guide our children and our grandchildren so they will find you in all they do. Father, I ask for comfort and healing for Lori's co-workers, uh, grandmother's family, and those that have lost loved ones this week. Let the loved ones gather around each other to help each other through. Give them hope for the future and be with them through it all, Lord Jesus. Father God, in the troubled times in America, it is right now. I ask for a spiritual awakening to flow through like a fire, rushing like the wind over all of America. Awaken the hearts and souls of the people of this nation. Bring wisdom and a knowledge of you back into our schools, our streets, the courtrooms, and all aspects of the government. Bring a revival of hearts to want to know you and do your will and not their own. Bring America and all the nations into a right relationship with you. Help us to acknowledge and follow the one and only true God of this universe. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, the Father of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And we praise you and honor you today in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. Recently, um, 
it's always fun to find new things, uh, new translations. Uh, Mark, I, and I've probably heard about it before, but the Berean Standard Bible used to be called Berean uh, Study Bible. I was reminded of what we're commanded to do. When we think of engagement. So here are the words from Matthew 28, verses, starting at verse 16. It says, Meanwhile, the eleven disciples went to Galilee to the mountain Jesus had designated. They went where he told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some still doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. But surely I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Christ is calling us to engagement. In order to engage, we have to follow this command, which tells us to go. On Wednesday night, as we were going through uh, Mark's summer from last week, talking about engagement, we talked about how <coughs> the disciples had to be made, they had gotten comfortable. In Jerusalem. How many of us get comfortable? It's comfortable just to sit at home at night, turn on TV, and watch some mindless show or movie. Granted, there's good stuff out there, but still, what else could we be doing? We could be preparing for the divine appointment or appointments that are coming the next day. So what is shaking you out of your Jerusalem as the disciples got shook out of Jerusalem because of the persecution they started to experience? What is prompting you to move? What is prompting you to go and get engaged? Father, as we end this portion of our service, Father, as we end this online portion, we thank you again for this series and the message that it brings to us. Father, may we ever grow ever closer to you. Father, we seek your face. We seek your will. We seek your purpose. Rattle us, Lord. Make us uncomfortable to where we have to move. It's no different, Father, than when we stop exercising and our muscles begin to atrophy. When we stop spending time with you, that relationship from our side of it, not yours, but through ours, we can become stagnant. Stir us up. Show us where you're prompting us to go and what you're prompting us to do, not just as a church, but as individuals. In Jesus' name, amen.